Hello and welcome to talk 8 in the Sermon on the Mount Digging Deeper series. We were thinking last time about the Beatitudes and how the Jews would receive them. This time we're moving on to look at the Beatitudes and how we, the Gentiles, would receive them. In other words, what they mean for you and me. Jesus would be aware that his message would be passed on, first of all, verbally. The message was for all people in all times, to show he is Messiah, to introduce the new covenant and to introduce the kingdom of heaven to everyone. To do this, he has to show us what life in the kingdom is like, and it appears that the kingdom of heaven has blessings in what seem to us the most unlikely circumstances. Equally, all the blessings here are for everyone. The meaning of blessed has changed dramatically since the time of Jesus. In society today, it usually means lucky, with health, wealth, love, fame, talent and so on. You will be blessed when you sneeze. You can be blessed with a nice house or to have just received the promotion you are after, material blessings. Or, in a totally different way, I've got to go to the blessed supermarket. Today's use is nowhere near its meaning in the time of Jesus. One Oxford dictionary tells us blessed means made holy, consecrated, or endowed with divine favour and protection. And that is how Jesus' listeners and Christians would see it. Blessed is the translation from the Greek word makarios, beatus in Latin, from which we get Beatitudes, and is used in many translations, including the Authorised Version and the New International Version. But it is not a good translation for today. Because of our modern understanding of blessed, some translators, although not many, use a different word or even a paraphrase. Happy is used by J.B. Phillips. Flourishing by Pennington. Wonderful News, Tom Wright, or Fulfilled, Rob Warner. The Beatitudes have four main themes running through that are picked up and developed elsewhere by Matthew. The first theme is the Kingdom of Heaven, a major theme of both the Beatitudes and of Matthew's Gospel. It serves as sandwich cover for the Beatitudes, appearing in 5 verse 20 and 7 verse 21. This invites hearers to tie in with the message Jesus had been preaching in Galilee immediately before the sermon. Jesus begins his sermon with a series of blessings that touch on almost every aspect of the inner, inner human life and show how contrasting is life in the kingdom of heaven to earthly life. We can get a deeper understanding of a blessing from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Although helping us, this would not, of course, have helped Jesus' original listeners. Ephesians 1, verse 3, reads, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. One of the Beatitudes, they will see God. But Ephesians says, we are blessed because of spiritual blessings and far outweigh any earthly blessings. In the Beatitudes, we call the sons of God. In the Ephesians, we are blessed because as chosen and adopted sons and daughters of the King, we will receive the richest blessing and very nature of Christ. Or, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And Ephesians, we are blessed because we are redeemed and forgiven, receiving the riches of his grace, as he has made known to us the mystery of his will, the gospel. And finally, we are poor in spirit. But Ephesians tells us we are blessed because we have a guaranteed inheritance and we have been sealed with the promised Holy Spirit until we acquire possession of it. Read Ephesians chapter 1 to take detail of these. 
Those walking in the kingdom of heaven already have these blessings and lives should show it. Jesus was setting the example of how we should live as he was already walking in that kingdom. This is life in the kingdom. Since the resurrection, we also have the constant presence of the Holy Spirit, visiting, comforting, strengthening and guiding. This does not, however, mean the end of blessings. God can and does still bless. And equally, we should be blessing God, giving him honour for his grace towards us and recognising our dependence upon him. Fuller understanding of some of the Beatitudes comes from Jesus' parables. For example, the best commentary on the first Beatitude is the parable of the Pharisee and the publican in St Luke, chapter 18, verses 10 to 14. Or the fifth Beatitude in the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18, 23 to 35. If you want a detailed comment on each individual Beatitude, there are many commentaries offering that. We can talk about that on the next Zoom link. The kingdom theme and human blessedness are not accidentally connected in the Beatitudes, nor in the book as a whole. They are totally intertwined. Secondly, we come to righteousness. And righteousness is an important characteristic of all believers. Jesus told the listeners, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. We can, by our own endeavours, climb the job ladder, achieve exam success, succeed in sport, attain a skill in a craft. But what humans can never do on their own is attain purity of heart, peace of mind, or gain righteousness. These are gifts from God that all can have through faith in Jesus, who is showing what life is like in the kingdom of heaven, and more significantly, how we could and should be living. Paul found that you could not attain righteousness through the law. Righteousness is a gift that comes from God and is by faith. Check out Philippians 3 verses 6 to 9. Searching for righteousness is two-sided. We want God's righteousness to come with our salvation, but equally we as disciples are expected to act with righteousness, needing to show God's righteousness to the world, as Jesus was doing. When we search for righteousness, we must of necessity get involved with repentance, and then we are dealing with the two key factors throughout the sermon and throughout the whole Bible, repentance and righteousness. John the Baptist has already told the people, I baptise you with water for repentance. Then, after me, one who is more powerful than I, he will baptise with the Holy Spirit and fire. The Beatitudes tell us those repenting and seeking righteousness righteousness meaning being right with God, will be filled. Filled with what? Jesus does not say specifically, but surely God's grace and the Holy Spirit referred to by John at Jesus' baptism. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can be comforted, show mercy, be righteous, and we can inherit the earth and have the kingdom. That is share in all the blessings. We will see God and be shown mercy. Righteousness is not external piety, as it was with the Pharisees, but is the faithful purity of the inner person coming from the heart. This is the new covenant, written on the heart, introduced as promise, and now in action. This is the covenant I will make with you, with the people of Israel, after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their mind and write it on their hearts. Jeremiah. Third one is persecution. 
and it appears in verse 11 that Jesus was telling his hearers to expect more persecution, more than Achilles, or Pilate, or Herod, or the Romans, if you follow his way. But the outcome could be your reward in heaven. This is a truth that Christians over the centuries have found and lived through. The Jews, God's chosen people, were and are persecuted, as are followers of the way. We see in the persecuted church today, people prepared to go to prison or give up their life rather than turn from God. The Gospels make further reference to this teaching of Jesus. For example, in John's Gospel, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 and 12, we will see that for the persecuted, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, not will be. As in the previous six Beatitudes, the lives of those persecuted today clearly shows this. And finally, the final theme is mercy. Referred to and here where we get not only the teaching verbally, but Matthew showing that Jesus walked the talk. The blessings listed in the Beatitudes are Jesus showing us that our life, our inner life, and what it should be like and will be like as people of the kingdom of God. Matthew goes on to illustrate what this means, showing how Jesus models precisely what he commends. The humble and poor in spirit, Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary. Those who mourn and grieve. Example, O Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets, I have longed to gather your children. In the Beatitudes, hunger and thirst for righteousness. Jesus' action, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Is pure in heart. Jesus says, away from me, Satan. Showing mercy. Jesus feeds the 5,000 or the 4,000. Bringing peace. Do not be afraid. Tell my brothers to go to Galilee. So, Jesus can say, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. In our prayers, perhaps we should begin by asking forgiveness for not living up to the statements Jesus taught here in the Sermon on the Mount. To, to conclude, I think we can learn from a Jewish scholar, Dr Nathan Lopez Cardozo, who wrote this. How wise were the sages of Israel when they instituted the custom of making a blessing on almost anything, whether it is eating, drinking, observing natural phenomena, or smelling extravagant aromas, they depicted all these activities as nothing less than totally miraculous. To bless and be blessed is a fundamental part of our relationship with God, as well as our relationship with other people. Blessings, whether given or received, help us to both recognise God in our lives and draw closer to him. It is not a recognition of riches, rather humble confession that we are not self-sufficient. God is all-powerful and perfectly self-sufficient. He didn't need mankind to begin with so all the more he doesn't need anything from us but he chose us he wanted fellowship with individual beings who have free will in return his simple presence 
is a reward that we could never earn nor achieve ourselves. By blessing God, we give him honour for his grace towards us. Thus, blessed are you, our God, is a declaration of trust and the greatest hope for him to reign over our circumstances. He is good and we are dependent on his goodness. When we bless God, it is his presence that increases in us. When we honour him, we acknowledge how he is increasing the goodness in our lives. And in order to live fully, we are dependent on his presence.